Jean-Michel Basquiat was from Brooklyn, like me. Although he spent most of his brief adult life in Soho, where he started off living in the streets as a graffiti artist who called himself Samo. He later became a celebrity in a downtown scene in New York in the 70s and 80s. He was hanging with Madonna before she was famous and collaborated with Andy Warhol. He came onto the scene with a crew of graffiti writers, but didn't want to be boxed in with that movement. So when the graffiti, graffiti scene died, he didn't die with it. He moved in a white art world, but flooded his art with black images, attitude, and icons. He wanted to be the most famous artist in the world. He was hip hop when hip hop was still in its cradle. If you look at the video for Blondie's Rapture, the first rap song, using the word rap loosely, to play on MTV, you see Basquiat, young, skinny, standing in front of a set of turntables while Debbie Harry struts by. He plays Spoonie G records at gallery opening. On the night he died, he was 27. Basquiat had been planning to see a Run DMC show. When people asked him what his art was about, he'd hit them with the same three words, royalty, heroism, and the streets. When he died in 1988, I'm not sure I knew who he was, even though he was a Brooklyn kid like me and not that much older. He was deep in a world that I really didn't have much to do with. I was making money out of state and rhyming in Brooklyn, not hanging out with Andy Warhol at the Mud Club. New York has a thousand universes in it that don't always connect. But we do all walk the same streets, hear the same sirens, ride the same subways, see the same headlines in the post, read the same writing on the walls. That shared landscape gets inside of all of us and in some small way unites us makes us think we know each other, even when we don't. Basquiat got his wish. He's probably among the most famous artists in the world, two decades after his death. I own a few of his paintings. He's known today, to some degree, as a painter that hip-hop seems to embrace. Part of that comes from his technique, which feels like hip-hop in the way it combined different traditions and techniques to create something new. He brought together elements of street art and Europe old masters. He combined painting and writing. He combined icons from Christianity and Santeria and voodoo. He turned boxers and jazz musicians into kings with golden crowns. And on top of all that mis mixing and matching, he added his own genius, which transformed the work into something completely fresh and original. The paintings don't just sit on my walls. They move like crazy. Light is blinding. Basquiat's work often deals with fame and success, the story of what happens when you actually get the thing you die for. One Basquiat print I own is called Charles I. It's about Charlie Parker, the jazz pioneer who died young of a heroin overdose, like Basquiat. In the corner of the painting are the words, most young kings get their heads cut off. Like a lot of the art Basquiat created, that line has layers of meaning. The head could mean the literal head on your shoulders, or it could be referring to your other head, to castration. I read it as a statement about what happens when you achieve a certain position. You become a target. People want to take your head, your crown, your title. They want to emasculate you, make you compromise or sacrifice in a way that no man or woman should. And you resist it until one day your albums aren't moving and the shows aren't filling up. And it seems like the game might have moved on without you. Then you start to change. You do whatever you need to do to get back into that spotlight. And that's when you're walking dead. One way or another, they get you. The cliche is, be careful what you wish for because you, you might get it. Nearly every rapper who's made it big or has even been modestly successful has had to deal with getting one of his heads chopped. Rappers like Pun, Big L, Old Dirty Bastard, Pimp C, among many, many others, have literally lost their lives just when they were about to peak. Rappers at the top of their game have been locked up, sometimes for long bids. The stories you hear can really make it seem like success can be a curse. Rappers who've been dangled over balconies for their publishing money, driven out of their hometowns, fucked up by drugs, sued by their own families, betrayed by their best friends, sold out by their crews, 
There are rappers who blow up and blow through whole fortune, squander every opportunity, and before you know it, end up back on the block. The crazy thing is, we don't even question it anymore. We take it for granted. I remember when Hammer was the biggest star in the world in the 80s. There were a lot of people who clowned him because of the big pants and the dancing, like he was the rapper from Disney World. But Hammer was from East Oakland. Even when he was spinning around with his pants billowing all around him, you could see it in his eyes that this was still a nigga from the hood. So when he was in Forbes magazine with eight figures after his name, big pants and all, I was impressed. It was a huge moment for hip hop. For a black rapper to make that kind of transition into the mainstream and to get that kind of money was unprecedented. A few years later, Hammer was filing for bankruptcy. Today, when you see stars rise and fall like that, you just think, yep, he fucked it up. But with Hammer, it was the first time we've seen that kind of fast movement from the bottom to the top and back again. It's no diss to Hammer to say that it was shocking to watch it happen. I'm sure he was as shocked as anyone. And of course, two of the greatest rappers to ever do it were both murdered in their prime. The not-so-funny shit is that Pac and Biggie were perfectly safe before they started rapping. They weren't being hunted by killers until they got into music. Biggie was on the streets before he started releasing music, but he never had squads of shooters or the feds coming after him until he was famous. And Pac wasn't even heavy in the street. It wasn't until he was a rapper that he started getting shot at, locked up, stalked by the cops, and eventually murdered. I was reminded of this when I recorded Moment of Clarity with Eminem for the Black Album. It was 2003 and he was on top of the music world. Three major multi-platinum albums, 20 million sold, a number one film with 8 Mile, and on and on. He was probably the biggest star in the world. When we met at the studio, I reached over to give him a pound. And when we bumped, I could feel that he had on a bulletproof vest. Here was Eminem, someone who was doing the thing he loved and succeeding at it, probably beyond his wildest dream. And he had to wear a bulletproof vest to the studio. He should have been on a boat somewhere enjoying himself without a care in the world, not worrying about getting shot up on his way to work. It's easy to take shots at performers when they seem to be when they seem to self-destruct. But there's another way to look at it. When you reach that top level, there's suddenly so much to deal with on all fronts. You have old friends and distant family who are suddenly close. People who feel like they should be getting rich from your success. You have a target on your back from other people. Rappers, hustlers, angry cops who feel like your success should be theirs. You have to deal with lawyers and accountants and you have to be able to trust these people you're just meeting with everything you have. There's just more of everything. Women, money, friends, piles of whatever your vice is. There's enough of whatever you love to kill you. That kind of sudden change can destabilize even the most grounded personality. And that's when you lose yourself. Like the Eminem song says, superstardom's close to a postmortem. It's stronger than heroin. I was lucky in a lot of ways to have a body of life experiences already under my belt before I had to deal with a serious level of success. I'd made friends and lost them, made money and lost it and made it back. I'd watched people blow up in the in both games, music and hustling, and then watch them fuck it all fuck it up and fall back to earth hard. I was prepared. All that happened to me in music over the first years of my career mirrored a lot of what I'd seen before, just on a larger scale. Eventually, the scale got so large that the comparisons stopped making sense or being as useful. But I'm lucky to have a lot of same friends and family with me that I had when I was recording my first album. People who keep me grounded. I'm also lucky never to have needed the approval of the gatekeepers in the industry because from the start, we came into the game as entrepreneurs. That gave me the freedom to just be myself, which is the secret to any long-term success. But that's hard to see when you're young and desperate just to get put on. When Basquiat painted Charles I, he was only 22. People always wanted to stick Basquiat in some camp or another to paste on some label that would be stable and make it easy to treat him like a commodity. But he was elusive. His eye was always on a bigger picture, not whatever corner people tried to frame him in. 
but mostly his eye was probably on himself, on using his art to get what he wanted, to say what he wanted, to communicate his truth. Basquiat shook an easy definition. He wasn't afraid of wanting, wanting to succeed, to get rich, to be famous. But just because you want the shit doesn't mean you can handle it. One critic said about Basquiat that the boys in his painting didn't grow up to be men. They grew up to be corpses, skeletons, and ghosts. Maybe that's the curse of being young, black, and gifted in America. And if you add sudden success to that, it only makes it more likely that you'll su succumb, like Basquiat did, in a loft not far from one, the one I live in now. A loft filled with his art. But I don't think so. I don't accept that falling is inevitable. I think there's a way to avoid it, a way to win. To get success and its spoils and get away with it without losing your soul or your life or both. I'm trying to rewrite the old script, but Basquiat's painting sits on my wall like a warning. Back in the 1990s, before file sharing became a real disruptor in the music industry, bootlegging was the worst threat. There is no analogy between bootlegging and anything that happens in the streets unless you count niggas going up in stash spots and straight robbing you. As an artist, you're in the position of having to guard your work from everyone. No one can answer you when you demand to know how your album was leaked in the first place. So you become paranoid. Is it the engineer in the studio, his assistant, the owner of the studio? Is it the label, the processing plant? I always had some sympathy for our diehard fans, the ones who were just looking for a way to get their hands on records they couldn't otherwise afford. Back when it was really rampant, I always threw away 100,000 units in projections to bootlegging. Knowing that bootleggers were so resourceful that they could never be completely beaten, no matter how careful you were. It's almost quaint to think about that now, since digital pirating accounts for many times as many copies as any bootlegger ever managed to get out of, on the streets. And back then, it was rare for the bootleg to dramatically beat the release date for the legit album. But when Volume 3, Life and Times of S. Doc Carter, my fourth album, hit the streets more than a month before the official release date, I was totally at a loss. This was really too much. I was flipping out on Def Jam staff, accusing people of having something to do with the bootleg copies on the street. I just couldn't believe how flagrant it was and how much more damaging it could be than the usual low-level bootlegging. I wanted to know how my shit got out. People kept giving me the same name as the source of the bootlegging. It was someone I knew, someone I never would have suspected. One night, I went to Q-Tip's solo album release party and at some point in the night, I ran into the guy everyone's been telling me is behind the bootleg. So I approached him. When I told him what I was, what I suspected, to my surprise, he got real loud with me right there in the middle of the club. I was, it was strange. We separated and I went over to the bar. I was sitting there like, no the fuck this nigga did not. I was talking to people, but I was really talking to myself out loud, just in a state of shock. Before I even realized what I was doing, I headed back over to him. But this time I was blacking out with anger. The next thing I knew, all hell had broken loose in the club. That night, the guy went straight to the police and I was charged with assault. I went to the Trump Hotel on Central Park West and holed up, tracking coverage of the incident in the media. After a couple of days, I called my lawyer and turned myself in at the precinct. That's when I realized how serious things were. Not because they threw me in the tombs, but because they started setting up a press conference. The district attorney had his publicist on the phone. The cop that was assigned to do the perp walk with me was combing his hair and fixing his collar. It was a complete show for them. The hilarious thing, if any of this can be considered funny, is that Rockaway bubble coat I was wearing when they paraded me in front of the camera started flying off the shelves the next three weeks before Christmas. At any given moment, Sean could lose it. When I was holed up in the Trump Hotel, my entertainment lawyer, Mike Guido, came by and taught me an old college game he used to play, Guts. My whole crew learned how to play. It's a high stakes game, and I like to watch how people react under the game's pressure. 
It's revealing. Guts is decept deceptively simple. You're dealt three cards. Aces and pairs are high. Once you're dealt your three cards, you have to decide whether or not to stay in. The best hand wins the pot. So it is essential to do a quick analysis, read your opponent, and most importantly, be decisive. It's a game that rewards the kind of self-possession and clarity that quiets your fight-or-flight reflexes. Gambling like that makes you aware of how often your immediate emotional impulses are to do something really stupid because it feels good for a moment, like what I did at the club that night. There are some lines in Streets is Watching, a song off my second album that captured this situation. The song's first verse starts off, Look, if I shoot you, I'm brainless. But if you shoot me, then you're famous. What's a nigga to do? And the second one starts, Now it's hard not to kill niggas. It's like a full-time job not to kill niggas. The streets can start to make you see the logic and violence. If a thing surrounds you and is targeted at you, it can start to seem regular. What may have once seemed like an extreme or unacceptable measure starts to seem just like seem like just another tool in your kit. Even after I left the streets, I was still under the kind of pressure that made me sometimes act without thinking. But when you slip and give in to that pressure in, in an instant, you can throw your whole life away. I had to learn to keep my mind still so I could think clearly and sometimes hold back even when my heart is telling me to go in. On the other hand, you have to know when you need to step up and act, even when it might seem reckless or someone in the, or seem reckless to someone on the outside. Knowing the difference between recklessness and boldness is the whole art of gambling. But in the end, you're just rolling the dice. As distracting as my indictment had become, I knew that the next single off my album, Big Pimpin, was a gem, even if it wasn't a conventional single by any stretch of the imagination. I asked UGK to get on the track with me because I was a huge fan of their music. Even though a lot of my East Coast fans didn't really know who they were, I'd always loved Southern hip hop and UGK combined great Southern bounce with sneakily complex rhymes and delivery. And they were funny as hell. Timbaland went wild on that track. He used pieces of North African music, horns that sounded damn near like geese. It didn't sound like anything else on the radio at the time, but I knew it was time to double down. I rallied the troops and I told my staff to get us on MTV's Making the Video, which hadn't been on a rap set before. I got Hype Williams to direct it. I'm notoriously tight with video budgets, but for Big Pimpin', I put out a million dollars. We headed to Trinidad for Carnival, then booked the mansion in Miami, got the biggest yacht we could find, and hired hundreds of girls from the top agencies. We went to Vegas with niggas on that one. But to me, it felt like a sure bet. When we released the single for Big Pimpin' in the first week of June 2000, it made up for the bootlegging, the indictment, everything. It was my biggest single up to that point. With enough bail money to free a Big Willie. The contrast between the million dollar extravagance of the Big Pimpin' video and the potential of being behind bars for years behind a mindless assault wasn't lost to me. Both were about losing control. Big Pimpin' is a song that I wrote in the middle of all the madness, a time when I might have been at my most paranoid and hedonistic. It's a song that seems to be about the purity of the hustler's thrill, pleasure cooked down to a crystal. The lyrics are aggressive. They're about getting high off that thrill, fuck sharing it or saving some for tomorrow. Break taboos live without limitation. Break taboos. Live without limitation. Spend money like it'll never run out. Fuck bitches and bounce. Forget about catching feelings. Jump out the plane and don't think about how you're going to land. But there's a couplet at the end. I got so many grams. If the man find out, it will land me in jail for life. That shows that even when you're out of control, you know that it could end at that moment, at any moment, which only makes you go harder. If the price is life, then you better get what you pay for. There's an equal and opposite relationship between boiling and falling. The winter before my case, Puff and Shine caught a case behind that shootout at Club New York. 
and just as I was being indicted, their case was being prepared for trial. The way Puff and Shine's trial unfolded was unreal. The district attorney's office spent a lot of money on prosecution, and it went on for more than a month. Less than a block from where Puff and Shine were being tried, the guys accused of bombing the World Trade Center in 1993 were on trial. There were barricades in front of their courthouse. It was a major trial, important to the city, the whole country, but no media were there. Meanwhile, Puff's courthouse was swarming with cameras and reporters. The local papers were writing about what Puff's mother was wearing to court. It was unfucking real. Of course, Shine got convicted, but the DA had to put, put on that spectacle to get Puff. When he walked, I knew they'd be even more aggressive about getting a conviction in my case, making an example of me where they failed with Puff. So I settled and took probation. No way was I going to allow myself to be a sideshow for the state. But more than that, I realized that I had a choice in life. There was no reason to put my life on the line and the lives of everyone who depends on me because of a momentary loss of control. It sometimes feels like complete disaster is always around the corner waiting to trap us. So we have to live for the moment and fuck the rest. That kind of fatalism, this game I play, ain't no way to fix it. It's inevitable. Feels like realism. But the truth is that you can step back and not play someone else's game. I vow to never allow myself to be in a situation like that again.